Good afternoon. I'm Mia Parrish. I am the Professor for Media Innovation and Leadership at Arizona State University, the Cronkite School of Journalism. And I am so glad to welcome all of you today to a discussion on countering disinformation and violent extremism in the digital age. So if you were not here for that, then you should go somewhere else if you wanted like the fun ride at Walt Disney World. Um, it is on the record, we're being live streamed, and it is exciting for me to be a part of moderating a discussion today with the Vice President for Global Policy and Content at Facebook, Monica Bickert. Um, she has a big job that includes um, a background with the, being the legal counsel at Facebook. She was also an assistant U.S. attorney with the Department of Justice, as well as being a resident legal advisor in the embassy in Bangkok. So she has a specialization in the work that she's doing um, with a heart for issues such as human trafficking and um, child exploitation. I find her particularly interesting in the time that we're dealing with today and the work that we're all facing, the challenges that we're facing. She is not in charge and responsible for data privacy. She can answer questions about that, but I know that's hot in the news, but um, that isn't her particular specialty or responsibility. Um, and what she does do is quite comprehensive, so I think we'll have lots of interesting things to talk to her about. To my right is Peter Bergen. Many of you know him. He is the Vice President for um, uh, for Global Studies and Fellows at New America, and he is a national security expert who's authored many, many books, and hopefully some of you, you have read some of them. They are fascinating. And he is a national security expert with CNN as an analyst, and he, both of us will be having a chat with her today, and we'll have time for questions as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mia, and thank you, Monica, for doing this. You know, obviously, Facebook has been in the news uh, quite a lot in the, over the last 48 hours. So, just <clears throat> and understanding that you're not responsible for data or privacy as your main day job, but can talk about them at a high level. Um, what is the, how does, what is Facebook's relationship with these Chinese uh, companies with which there's been some data sharing? Uh, Facebook has publicly said that four of them have received data from Facebook. So, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, first, I want to be really clear that these are, this is not the same thing as the APIs uh, that were used by developers like Alexander Kogan um, and, and Cambridge Analytica. Those are APIs where developers can ask users for, for data and then they can create some sort of different experience, some sort of app experience. The APIs that have been addressed in articles over the last few days are device integrated APIs that allow Facebook to run on different types of phones. So these are things that, that started more than 10 years ago. If you think back to, it's actually kind of hard to remember, but if you think back that long ago to what Facebook or other services looked like on your phone, there wasn't really an app store. And Facebook wasn't built for those versions of phones. So um, in fact, the the um, iOS, Apple, Amazon, BlackBerry, the way that you would access Facebook on those services was for them to have an agreement with us where they could um, integrate Facebook into what they offered. So there, and, and it, it did mean that there would be data on the device itself, but not data stored at the company's server. So that's a point that uh, you'll see if you read the, the coverage of this. And we put out a newsroom post. If you go to newsroom.fb.com, I think is the address, or just Google Facebook Newsroom, you'll find a post that we put out where we sort of go through exactly what companies, why they had access to these device APIs. All of these were, um, structured by Facebook and the company. So again, very different from the Cambridge Analytica APIs. These, are, these were structured agreements where it was so that Facebook could run um, on these platforms. Now, as time has passed, and now um, you don't need as much of that because there are app stores and there are other ways for, for people to access Facebook, a lot of those have been phased out already. And uh, with the Chinese companies, one of them, I think, will be phased out even this week. And so this is, this is an ongoing process, but it's just very clear to keep what we're talking about here is something that's very common for if you're accessing Gmail, if you're accessing Yahoo Mail. That's the way that these sorts of applications are presented on different devices. And the same answer applies then to um, 
US phone carriers were. Right. Um, you mentioned Cambridge Analytica. What, is the, what, are, what are the lessons learned and how do you prevent that <clears throat> kind of thing happening again? Cambridge Analytica, just to give people a little bit of background on um, how the platform works. If you are an app developer, so you, you have uh, some sort of service you want to offer people and you want to be able to offer it through Facebook or attract Facebook users, then you basically sign up for a set of terms and uh, there are platform policies and our, our uh, terms of service. And then you can ask users if, um, when you, let's say you go to a, a site and you say, and you've probably had this experience, you go to a site and they say, do you want to log in with Facebook? And it's not Facebook. Well, if you say, yes, I do, then they use the Facebook integration for developers, which is you know, a way for them to say, uh, would you like to, through Facebook, give us this information? We need your hometown. We need your email address. We need your photos, because this is a photo sharing app that you're going to be signing up for, whatever the case is. They ask you for that permission. Well, back in 2013, which is uh, the time frame where the Alexander Kogan app, This Is Your Digital Life, was running, back in 2013, our rules were much more permissive. Basically, if you were an app developer, you could sign up, and then you could ask users for permission to access certain types of data, and they could even share with you um, things their friends had shared with them. So your friend shares a photo with you, and then you're signing up to use an app, you could share that photo with the app developer. Those were the rules that were in place back in 2013, which was obviously a pretty different world than we live in now. In 2014 and 2015, we changed the uh, way the platform worked so that app developers had to for anything beyond the most basic data, they had to actually apply to Facebook for sort of permission to ask users to share their data. And they had to show um, why they would need that data to make the app run better. And uh, if it was not necessary to the running of the app, then they would not be able to ask users for it at all. So back with Cambridge Analytica, that app, This Is Your Digital Life, was able to ask people for extensive data and get that data and use it. Now, even then, the platform policies made clear that they could not sell that data or use that data in ways with a third party. Um, so what is being investigated right now is whether or not they, in fact, did misuse the data. Those are certainly the allegations. And that investigation is ongoing. Um, and we are cooperating with that investigation. But what happened then would not be possible now because of the way that the, the rules changed in 2014 and 2015. Beyond that, so, so that's one thing. It's just like under, our, under the way that we run um, uh, access to data through apps, that just wouldn't be possible now. But there are other steps we're taking. One thing we're doing is we're going back and we're looking at all the apps back in 2013 and before that did have access to data. And we're doing an audit to understand if there are other app developers uh, where there should be a more thorough investigation to see if they misuse data. We're also very committed to notice. So we notified back in April anybody whose data might have been misused um, by this is your digital life. Again, that investigation is ongoing, so we don't have the details on that. Uh, but those are some of the steps we're taking. And then we're also expanding what we call our white hat program. We've had a long-standing program where we reward people who bring to our attention bugs or vulnerabilities. And we're now expanding that so that if people have information about apps that may have misused data that they got, um, we want to make sure we're rewarding people for bringing that forward. How have you seen, so transparency has been an issue um, and a question around um, the use of the data and the use of the information. And so with the, the investigation is ongoing. And what does it look like? What can users expect to see? with the outcome of that? Well, one thing is um, notice at an individual level, which we've provided with Cambridge mm -hmm. Analytica, but uh, are, very, uh, are very committed to that. Um, the other thing is we're just trying to give a lot more transparency around our processes. Mm -hmm. I joined Facebook six years ago and um, took over the policies five, and, five years and change um, ago. And back then, it was basically what we did on the policies was sort of within Facebook. We didn't really talk to other companies about it, maybe a little bit, but, um, and we didn't really talk publicly about it. I didn't talk to a lot of journalists. That's changed a lot, and I would say um, maybe by 2015, like May of 2015, we were a lot more transparent and starting to get comfortable mm -hmm. talking more to 
the media speaking. I started doing a lot more events like this, and uh, we started publishing a lot more on the site. In the past two years, now we have um, taken it, I think, to a new level uh, with uh, blog posts about some of the hard issues we're confronting, where we know some people won't like the answers, but we're just trying to put it out there. Um, my team, and um, we do, gosh, hundreds of uh, media engagements and public appearances you know, in the, in the, uh, every quarter. So there's a lot we're trying to do to just get out there. And then we're also just trying to give people transparency about our processes generally by having people observe our policy development process, our enforcement process. These audits, we're talking about the process more publicly. Um, well, something we'll get into a little bit later, I think, is what we're doing around election research. We're trying to commission um, independent research on Facebook and Facebook's role in things like democracy so that we can just be more open about the issues we're confronting and how we're dealing with them. Well, what, to uh, elaborate on that last point. On the election research? <laughs> yeah. Um, we have, so there's this really interesting tension between, um, on one hand, when I, when I speak at events like this, I get questions like, hey, why don't you guys make more data available for analysis and for research? You need to do that. You have this data, and there's a lot you could do to understand for, for social good. And then at the same time, we have the concerns like we were just discussing with Cambridge Analytica, where um, there's a, uh, a real push to say, don't share any data ever. So there's a couple things we know. You know, one thing is uh, sharing data um, it has to be something that is done with consent of users, and often what this is is aggregate, aggregated, anonymized data for very limited purposes. And, and this is not my area, or yeah. our privacy team should, should really address that. But, um, but one thing that we're looking at is can we have uh, research that is done with full transparency, tra transparency into who's doing it and what they're doing, and have them do that in a way that does not affect user privacy. So we've just commissioned a, um, a or, or sort of launched a, uh, a research initiative that will look at Facebook's role in democracies. And uh, the, it's funded by, I think, seven different groups. And uh, the exact committee has not been picked, but this will be a, a committee of academics and, and researchers who will come together and look at proposals and, um, and then carry out the research. And then they will publish that research. And that's not something that Facebook will, we won't be vetting that or, or playing any sort of um, uh, screening role in that. That's just something that we are uh, committed to getting out there. And our hope is that um, not only will that Will that give some transparency into people actually understanding what the role is, uh, what Facebook and other social media roles in the elections? But it's actually going to guide us in some of the efforts that we're undertaking right now. There's a lot we've done in the, since the 2016 election to focus on election integrity. Um, some of that is just simply to get better at removing fake accounts and, and, and those that are spreading disinformation. Um, and there's a lot we can talk about there. But then some of the other initiatives we're working on are around transparency. For instance, we launched in uh, late May, so very recently, we launched some initiatives around ads transparency with political advertisements now. You can, you can uh, look at the ad and see who paid for it. You can click on the ad and see the other advertisements that are being run and um, more granular information about who's being targeted with that ad and what the spend is on, on that ad. So, a lot of transparency initiatives that we think will be helpful, but having something like the research um, initiative come out with more concrete findings about what our role is in elections will help guide those efforts. When um, do you give in, you mentioned individual notice, do you give individual, individual notice to people who've uh, read Russian disinformation? The, um, the accounts that we removed, y yes. So the, the accounts that we removed um, in, before and after the 2016 election. When people, when people read our um, posts, if you did, or heard things about um, the Russian Internet Research Agency content, uh, that was a two-year span. So some of that was before the election, some of that was after the election. But for all of that, we put out notifications at the individual user level so that people could see if they had, um, if they had viewed one of those uh, pieces of disinformation or anything from the Russian IRA pages. What do you see happening in the upcoming election, the midterms? Well, um, 
I, one thing I'll, I'll say is we don't, we're not, we are focused on, on the U.S. midterms, but there are so many elections around the world right now where this is an issue. So whether it's Mexico or Brazil or India, um, Facebook, more than 85% of people using Facebook are outside the United States. And uh, some very big countries uh, in terms of social media and Facebook use are, are countries like India, like Brazil, where, um, where there are elections coming up. So um, we're focused on a couple things. One is um, making sure that we're removing fake accounts. When we think about disinformation that is shared, the biggest category of disinformation is or false news is coming from fake accounts that are financially motivated. And these are the, your sort of accounts that are sharing links to take you off site to some sort of ad farm. Um, and sometimes it's, it's you know, links that are disguised to look one way. Otherwise, it's, it's just stuff that looks sensationalist. You click on it, it takes you off site. And that's all uh, for money. Well, those tend to be run overwhelmingly by fake accounts. So if we get better at detecting the fake accounts and removing them, that takes a lot of that off the site. And since the 2016 US election, um, we've been working on our technical tools to get faster at that. So before the German election, before the French election, we removed tens of thousands of fake accounts using these new tools. Now, were they all election related? Probably not. But you get rid of those bad actors. You are decreasing the chance of having that information out there. Um, the second thing we're doing is focusing on overall efforts to combat misinformation or disinformation. And this is not necessarily about removing content. This is more about giving people context about the content that they are seeing. And this is also, although I think it's important for elections, has, it doesn't just live in the world of election integrity. This is the overall what do you do about fake news kind of question. Um, which you call which, false news. Well, I, I mean, I, I think. Which is, a, I think, a better way of I, I framing think it. it. It depends. I mean, I, I think um, you'll see most of our posts from the company do talk about false news, and that's an effort to be, um, to be a little bit more definitive about what we're talking about. But you hear people use the term fake news, and I think that the important thing is just to be clear what you're talking about. So you have the stuff that is clearly maliciously spread by fake accounts. Okay, that's fine. If we can find that, we can remove it. Then you have your stuff that is maybe close to the line, maybe some of it's uh, not factually accurate, but some of it is. Then you have your stuff where maybe the facts aren't technically wrong, but it's spun up in a way with a sensationalist headline. So there's this whole spectrum. And what we're trying to do is find different ways of treating disinformation or misinformation at the different points along that spectrum. So removing the stuff that has uh, the fake accounts behind it, um, or that is clearly you know, the video that a appears to be a news video and you click on it, it's not a video at all, it takes you off site. Okay, that stuff, we can remove it. Um, the middle stuff we're focusing on reducing the distribution, so countering the virality of that, and then providing information about what people are seeing. So right now, if you see um, a link to an article on Facebook and, it's, and you think, well, th this is absolutely fake, you can report that as fake. And then we actually have third-party fact-checking organizations that look at that. And if they come back and say, yeah, this is not accurate, then we provide, for, for people who will see that content in the future, we provide underneath it related articles that are from um, other sources around the internet to give people the context from mainstream sources. And then there's also a little icon, a little eye that you can click on. And that gives you information about who is behind that story, that publisher and who they are. And I think typically that information comes from Wikipedia and other internet sources. Um, and, that's, and we're also exploring, uh, with, with the Cronkite School of Journalism and others, um, we're looking at ways that we can increase overall savvy of the consumer, of the user, as they're looking at media in sort of distinguishing between what is likely accurate and what is likely not accurate. So that's the, that, so when it comes to, to kind of circle back, when it comes to election integrity, um, we're doing research, we're focused on political ads transparency and, and making the advertisements a lot easier for people to, to understand who's paying for them. Um, and then we're focused on, at combating fake news, false news, Disinformation you mentioned the German election, and it was actually it was pretty uh, relative to the 2016 American election. It was uh, disinformation was not a big factor. Um, so, do you anticipate for the midterms that will be the, the same case here? Well, we've certainly gotten better. Um, you know, we 
one big difference between the, the German election and the US presidential election is that we had vastly improved our technical tools for finding fake accounts. That helps. Another thing was that we had a very open line of communication with the German government where they could report to us uh, campaigns that they were seeing and we could investigate. That didn't exist with us with the US government. Does that um, exist now with the US government? We're certainly trying to open channels of communication. It does not change the policies that apply, by the way. This is something that we do globally. We want governments and others, of civil society groups, to be able to clearly communicate to us if they see something that they think we need to investigate. So uh, we're focused on that in the US. Um, we're also focused on our fake account detection tools and, and making them work here. But another piece is that transparency piece. And that's something we actually didn't have with the German election. Um, but coming around to the US midterms, we're really focused on having the ads be a lot more transparent. The ads are what drive, that's what drives the, um, the viewing of the pages. Mm -hmm. Your organic page will get you know, a certain amount of reach in people's news feed, but a lot of that is driven by, um, by paid ads. So what does that look like? Help us understand how the changes that you've made, because there's such financial incentives to essentially send people down a rabbit hole of crazy, you know, and that that's hard to combat. And that's also, you talked about the virality of that. I'm curious yeah. about how quickly you're able to come at it, because it can get pretty bad pretty quickly, especially when there's a financial incentive around it. Yeah, like, like so many of our, um, of the policies that we enforce, there's sort of a mix of technical tools and mm -hmm. human reporting. So this is true with misinformation. It's also true with things like, uh, like hate speech or terror propaganda, mm -hmm. where um, the, fastest, the faster we can get to it, the better. And sometimes that means using technical tools to find it. But a lot of, a lot of the time, that still means making it easier for people to report it to us. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage of, I mean, when you started, uh, AI was uh, sort of a, you know, the, the, the promise of AI was not what it is today. So how do you, how, what, give us a sense of, like, you run this content uh, part of Facebook. How many people work for you? What do they do? Uh, how much is AI a percentage of the work versus humans? Uh, what is, when does it have to be kicked up to a human? Walk us through. Sure. Mm -hmm. The way the system works, so we've got a, a set of policies. And I'm just going to focus on user-generated content policies. So we have separate policies for ads, which, which my team also manages. But, um, but, but for user-generated content, what you can post. Can you post a beheading video? Uh, can you post pornography? The answer to both of those is no, by the way. But um, so we have, we have these policies. And then um, we, don't, we don't look at every post that goes live. We have billions of posts, billions of photos every day coming onto the site. Instead, we try to make it easy for people to report posts or accounts or pages or groups to us. And then we also use technical tools to find content that we think is likely to violate our policies. <laughs> And both of those categories get sent to our community operations team. And these are basically our, our content reviewers. There are thousands of them. I think our last public figure on that was 7,500, but that's a pretty yeah. old figure. So it's, it's, uh, it's more than that now. Um, they're sitting around the globe. They're reviewing content 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in dozens of languages, and applying our policies. Um, my team oversees the community operations team and the, de the decisions that they're making. So if there's something that comes up where they're not really clear how the policy applies, and they would escalate that and it would go up the chain to my team. Um, my team, I think our last public figure was 60 people. Again, it's, it's uh, larger than that now, and I have one of my team members sitting here in the front row. Um, but uh, that our, our team is responsible not only for overseeing the application of those policies, but also refining those policies. Because based on what's happening in the world and how the user demographic is, is growing and changing, there are always new things that we have to confront with our policies. So um, the process is basically one team is setting the policies and refining those policies. And that's done with a lot of external input. That's not Facebook working in a silo. That's um, literally hundreds of organizations that we reach out to. If, if we're dealing with, you know, we were dealing with uh, what to do with photos of fetuses in early April. That was one of our um, issues. We're reaching out to pro-life groups and pro-choice groups and um, you know, groups around the world that are confronting that issue in different ways to understand all the nuances. And then um, refining the policies, communicating that guidance to our community operations reviewers. And, and then they are reviewing all the content that is flagged by users or that is raised by our technical tools. And then lastly, you asked, what's the mix of yeah. How often do our, does AI find things, and how often do human reviewers find things? Um, I'd say there's actually three buckets. There's when humans find things, people out in the community flagging things for us. 
Um, then there's when AI finds things. And then there's when other technology that's not quite AI, but things like um, image matching software. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's pretty blunt. It's not a, a particularly intelligent technology, but um, that, that actually is, is a very important category of identifying bad content for us. So right now, um, with things like terror propaganda, our technical tools, mostly in the third bucket, in the software image matching, they find the majority, the vast majority, of the content that we remove from uh, Facebook for being terror propaganda. So more than 99% of what we remove for terror propaganda is flagged by our technical tools. That tends to be because once we know that there's, say, a new beheading video out there, or formal propaganda from a terror group, we can reduce that image using the software to basically a number, which we call a hash, and then we store that hash, and if anybody else tries to upload that, then we catch it at the time of upload. And we now contract with third-party intelligence providers who will tell us, they're looking elsewhere on the internet, and they'll say, hey, this group has just put out this new video, and they can give it to us, and we can review it before it ever hits Facebook. So, um, and, and we, we, you know, sort of track how quickly are we getting to these things. Can we actually stop them from being uploaded at all? Technical tools are very good in something like that. Also with child sexual abuse imagery. Um, much harder would be something like hate speech, where the, uh, the policies are very contextual. You can use an ethnic slur in a way that you're attacking somebody. You can also use it by saying, this morning somebody called me this, it was really upsetting. You can also say, how do people view this word? We should have a discussion about it. Um, there's all different ways you might use that word. So it's much harder to, to use artificial intelligence to find that sort of bad content. We're investing in it, we are trying. There are efforts underway, but right now most of that is flagged by people. Um, we put out a transparency report on this was maybe a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. If you Google Facebook government requests report, you'll find it, where we, we actually released for the first time um, what our takedown numbers are for certain categories of content, including hate speech and terror propaganda, um, and then I think fake accounts and spam, and then how proactive we are, meaning how much of this are we finding with technology versus people. And whereas terror propaganda, fake accounts, spam, it's, it's overwhelmingly found by our technical tools. With hate speech, I think it was, don't quote me on this, you can look online, but it's something like 30, 36% is found by our technical tools, meaning artificial intelligence. And the other, uh, the remainder is by people reporting it to us. Hate speech is uh, a crime, uh, inciting racial hatred is a crime in the United Kingdom, Holocaust denial is a crime in Germany, denigrating the Prophet Muhammad is a crime in Pakistan. You mentioned this 85% figure. Um, so how do you, I mean, you're a global company, you're in charge of global content, uh, and, and uh, um, but you're based in uh, California, uh, you're an American company, and how do you sort of balance these, and how do you deal with the very different um, kind of imperatives in a country like Pakistan, where everybody's on Facebook and... Right. Um, well, well, there's one set of global, as you mentioned, there's one set of global policies, that's when we will actually remove content. It violates our bullying policies or our terrorism policies, it comes down, um, and that's, those are the policies that you'll see online, our community standards, um, that are set by my team that sits in 11 offices around the world. Then there are uh, our policies for dealing with illegal content that governments flag to us. And the basic process is any government can reach out to us and say, this doesn't violate your community standards, but it violates our laws. And if it violates their laws, we look at the legal process they provided, our legal team actually does that, and we, we will often talk to counsel in that particular country and see, is this law, is it valid? Uh, does it actually, is it by the right authority? Um, the, the request that we're getting, is the request from the right authority? Is the content actually covered by this law? Um, and if all the, and is it consistent with human rights and, and uh, international norms? And if it is, then we will actually restrict that content in uh, that particular jurisdiction. Um, there are also, candidly, some practical considerations there. We want to make sure that we are preserving Facebook and speech for as many people as possible. So sometimes we have to look at, um, you know, when we're, when we're facing a request, some of those requests are really easy. Like this is, uh, the, the German hate speech law is a little bit different than our hate speech definition. They, there's something about 
refugees in this particular instance that wouldn't violate our policies, but they say it violates their law, okay, fine. What we do is we will block that content in Germany, and then we report on that in our government request report. You can go online, you can click on Germany, and you can see how many times have they asked Facebook to block content, and um, what have we done about it. There are, other there are other cases where it's much harder. Um, and we're still, there's not, uh, there's not an easy answer to that, and we're not alone in confronting that as a social media company. If you um, think about, for instance, what, uh, uh, what other companies have faced in countries like Vietnam. Um, sometimes the, the practical reality is that to operate in those countries, you need to respect their laws. To the extent that uh, we and other social media companies do that, we, pub we try to be very transparent about that and publish it in our transparency reports. You mentioned Vietnam, yeah. which somehow triggered the Rohingya. Um, I mean, Facebook has got a fair amount of criticism about um, the incitement of violence against the Rohingya in, in Myanmar. Um, what, if anything, can you do about that? I think one of the biggest things we have to do is um, improve our uh, relationship with civil society groups on the ground. We, we've been, to be clear, we've been working with civil society groups on the ground in, in Myanmar for years. In fact, I've personally met with some of them um, as long as three or four years ago and talked to them about making it easy for them to tell us about trends they're seeing on the ground. But it's a complicated landscape and there's a lot more we can do there. And then the other thing we need to do is ramp up our uh, language review. There's, it's, it's tempting when you think about um, hiring content reviewers to just think about it in terms of how many reports you get from a certain country or in a certain language. Because we get millions of reports every week. So it's tempting to say, well, let's just look at the volume we get in certain languages and then we'll hire accordingly. But what we've seen over the years is that, that, that you need to have um, special consideration for places where the speech-related issues, whether it's because there's violence on the grounds or um, there are, uh, there's an influx of migrants and there's a lot of hate speech. There's certain areas where there's a disproportionate need for uh, language review to be done around the clock. And we're seeing that in Myanmar. It's not always easy, candidly, to hire um, native speakers in all of the languages that we need and to hire for that coverage to be around the clock. I mean, I can, I can think back to, this was probably three years ago, I can think back to a time when we were, we were struggling to find um, a Burmese speaker to sit in our Dublin office because we needed to have um, that sort of coverage. And we've, we're, we're now trying to make sure that not just with Burmese, but with other, Angli with other languages, I mean, you think about India and all the different languages there are there, or you think about the southern Philippines, um, trying to get language coverage and ensure that it allows us to respond to a crisis, even if that crisis hits in the middle of the night, is uh, something that we need to do better. How does GDPR affect Facebook and its model, and do you see sort of the EU standards about privacy sort of migrating here? Um, again, with the big caveat that I'm not the privacy person. Uh, GDPR, we have been working as a company, this is the new European privacy legislation, uh, we've been working hard as a company for well over a year to, uh, to make sure that what we do is GDPR compliant, and that includes giving people options to opt out of facial recognition or to opt out of advertisements that are from uh, data obtained from partners. Like if you go on a website and there's a Facebook like button and you're, and you're liking that. Um, so the controls and transparency that we are offering in Europe are going to be um, offered globally. We're, we've built those controls so that they will be global. Um, the, the, form, the, for, the format of the notice may look different. There's a very sort of strict uh, legal way that we need to do that under GDPR. But, um, but yes, this will be the, the enhanced um, control and transparency will be tools for everybody. So you have that weight and pressure of upholding and helping democracy and journalism and disinformation and but you're a private company. You know, we were talking earlier about some of the um, ways in which cases like with Twitter and the blocking of accounts has come to be treating a private company like a public space. You know, could you give us a little context on what that looks like for you, especially as a global company that has all these different competing interests? And it's uh, it, it is it's an interesting um, it's an interesting landscape in that. Um, as Mia points out, you, you definitely have, you'll have some countries saying, um, this is illegal in our country and you need to remove it. 
and then, even though it doesn't violate your policies. And then you'll have other situations where countries are saying, maybe this violates your policies, but it would be protected in our country, and you need to leave it up. Um, for instance, there are, um, you know, without, without naming countries, there's a situation where we have a policy where we remove extremist organizations, including designated hate organizations. And these are organizations that are, um, uh, you know, they, their, their fundamental tenet is propagating hate against people based on race, religion, uh, gender, gender I identity, sexual orientation, and so forth. Um, once an organization is designated a hate organization, they're not allowed to be on Facebook, and people aren't allowed to praise or support that organization. Well, we have one country that has said, well, you might consider this a hate organization, but uh, we're fine with them being in our country, and we think you need to allow them on Facebook. And you can imagine, if you, if you sort of take that logic uh, to its conclusion, you can imagine a situation, we don't allow terror groups. You can imagine a situation where, uh, you know, somebody might say, well, this really violent terror group that's uh, organizing mass violence, you need to let them do that on Facebook. And that's incompatible with our, our fundamental principle, which is we want Facebook to be a, a safe place where people can come and, and connect and share themselves um, in a safe way. So uh, we're, how we're trying to strike that balance is we want, to be, uh, we want to be respectful of countries' laws if there's something that violates their laws that doesn't violate our standards. But at the same time, we have a floor, which is these are our community standards. And stuff that is below that line, stuff that violates our standards, uh, we will remove. And, and um, you know, we've had those conversations with, uh, with groups and, and with governments, and, and hopefully that's, that's something that people will uh, respect, that this is, a, this is a community where we want to have some norms, and those norms are represented by our standards. Are there any lessons learned from, I mean, you've been there for uh, this incredibly significant uh, period of time uh, where the first big problem was really the terrorism problem, it seemed more than the disinformation problem. Um, were there lessons learned from uh, dealing with, or attempting to deal with the terrorism problem, understanding that you can never completely deal with it, yeah. uh, that are applicable to the disinformation? I mean, are there hashtag tag sharing things that you do with, with other companies, or what, what yeah. are the lessons? I think a, a big lesson is um, it can't be a one, con uh, one company approach. What we saw with terror propaganda, it's, it, is, um, it is easier for the bigger companies to tackle this. And if the, just, be, just because of resources and technology and, and learnings that you get, you know, Facebook, the way Facebook runs as a service, um, there are, uh, if we find one bad account, we can sometimes fan out from that and find other bad accounts. So uh, the bigger companies sometimes are just going to have more success at, at finding and removing that content. It's much harder for the smaller companies. And so what we saw with uh, terror propaganda, especially from groups like ISIS, is if the, good, if the big companies the better the big companies get at this, the more the bad guys are just going to move to the smaller companies. And so it has to be an all-industry approach. Mm -hmm. That's um, something we learned a little bit with child safety, but I think it really, the, the sophistication and coordination of the terror groups, I think, uh, really brought that lesson home. So we do now work, uh, and have for the past, I'd say, three years, been working with other companies in the industry on this. Mm -hmm. You know how I said like five years ago, we didn't really talk that much to the other companies? That's changed in the past five years substantially. Starting with maybe three years ago, um, we were already doing a lot of cross-industry work in child safety, but with terrorism, we were having informal roundtables. We reached out, we invited 18 companies to come to Facebook and talk about best practices around countering terrorism. Um, Actually, I guess we were, we were one of them, so 17 companies. And, um, and then we would meet every once in a while. And then we finally formalized that last June and launched the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. Sort of a, a separate parallel effort is a hash sharing initiative that we launched in 2016, um, December 2016, which is companies coming together and sharing those digital signatures that I mentioned earlier sharing those with one another in a database so that we can all, if, if Twitter finds a, um, a new propaganda video, they can use the same matching software that we're using, reduce it to a number, put it in the database, we can access that number, and then we can stop the video from ever hitting Facebook. Those collaborative efforts have, I think, really been um, the way to make it hard for these groups to operate online.
there's still, just like with the disinformation actors, um, this takes me back to my days as a criminal prosecutor, those who want to abuse the system are going to keep on trying. So mm -hmm. they're going to do this, you're going to have a measure to counteract them, and then they're going to find a different way, and then you're going to have to counteract <laughs> that. So um, it's, as you said, it's not just going to stop, but I think we've gotten better by working together. But ultimately, you know, if they migrate to Telegram in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer model, it's actually not that great for them. I mean, obviously, it's great for operational planning, but they, well, they ultimately, they want to be broadcasters, right? right? Mm -hmm. so, right. so how would you assess Facebook and your own and other companies, I mean, in terms of um, your impact on the world? I think in April, you announced the 1.9 million accounts yes. being taken down. Is that, uh, you know, give us some context, is that a, you know, a, a large number in the, in the great, great scheme of things, a, a medium number, what, what is it? Um, so in the, the, what we announced was, and this is part of that overall transparency report I talked about earlier, in the last quarter we removed 1.9 pieces of content for violating our terrorism 1. policies. 1.9 million. 1 point, sorry? 1.9 million. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, for, did I say 1.9 pieces of content? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're better than that. We almost um, got that's the, the bar, right? <laughs> 1.9 million pieces of content that we removed for violating our terrorism policies. Um, uh, what's the impact? You know, it's, I think it's hard, it's hard for us to say. I will say that um, the, as, as these companies have worked together, we now have tens of thousands of images in that uh, terrorism database. And to me, that's the bigger impact. Because we're, smaller companies are now using that software. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you think about the, the counterterrorism operation at, at Facebook. We've got you know, roughly 200 people that are working. Their, their primary function at Facebook is countering terrorist use of our service. And so we've got engineers that are working on technical systems to find stuff. And we've got um, specialized reviewers. And we've got experts like Brian Fishman on my team, who used to run West Point's Counterterrorism uh, Research Center. Um, these people, and, he, and maintains relationships with academics who study this stuff. So there's, there's a whole lot going on to find this. And then you compare that to a smaller company where it's five engineers. Actually, there's one company that we work with that's literally one guy. It's one guy. And he is the engineer, and he runs the service, and he's not making any money from it at all. And um, those companies are not going to have the technical tools to find this stuff or the infrastructure to review it. And so um, in terms of impact, that's seeing that we have tens of thousands of images in that database, I think, is, is big. But, um, but I also think we don't and this is something where, where uh, candidly, you know, you or the Brian Fishmans of the world are, are really the experts. Um, I'm not the expert in how that is disrupting these groups' ability to function, um, but we are trying to understand that, and that's one of the reasons that we're partnering with groups like Brookings um, and with uh, a research institute in the UK to see how terror groups' attempts to use social media are changing. So it's, it's fascinating, the partnership piece of this, you know, where you, yeah. you started out as a company to be you know, your own thing, your own stock, your own everything, and now you've become this fighter of global terrorism in partnership with essentially competitors or partners you wouldn't have thought of, like a Cronkite News right. around news literacy. And what does that look like going forward? And where do you see the use of, you've got this huge database, and what are you going to do with it? What are you yeah. going to... Um, with the hash sharing database, or with I will, uh, I, or the with just generally, yeah, generally. Um, I mean, you you could you're helping fight uh, trafficking of small children. You right. know, I mean, it's a totally different mission from the one that you started. And and, and one difference, um, it, which you've alluded to, is more partnerships. Right. I think so. More partnerships and more transparency. Mm -hmm. um, one example I can give. Uh, I told I told you earlier that my team sets these policies and we refine them. We do that through this meeting that we have every two weeks called our Content Standards Forum. And that meeting is, uh, if, if you uh, were to join that meeting, it's every other Tuesday. And it's this very global meeting. There's people dialing in from India and Singapore and all over. And, um, and there, there's people from our legal team and our operations team and our engineering team and our diversity team and um, so forth. Then there's our stakeholder engagement team. And they are also very present in these meetings. Their job is to get the input from the experts outside of the room. Excuse me. So um, that's something that, if I think back three years ago, first of all, we didn't have a stakeholder engagement team. Right. We had some relationships with some safety groups, um, but it wasn't formalized in the way it is now. Now you don't see a proposal for a policy change without also seeing what different groups are saying about our options and um, and 
you know, if they're cautioning us to be careful in this area or whatever, that's something that we take really seriously. So um, I think that's only going to continue. We also are, are starting to give more transparency around processes like the Content Standards Forum. We've now had several meetings where we've actually just had journalists join or academics join mm -hmm. and watch and give us their feedback into the process and what they're seeing. Um, I think those are the trends you'll continue to see in the future, mm -hmm. more partnerships and more openness about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Which um, should we open it to the yes. questions? Which if you have a question, raise, raise your uh, hand, wait for a mic and identify yourself. All right. Um, the mic is closed. A mic coming, maybe start where you are in the back and we can move around. Pick a, there you go. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mark Jacobson, Georgetown University. I just want to uh, commend you on what you've done in terms of the countering violent extremism front, and then, of course, I'll do the Washington, but uh, I'm a little <laughs> uh, more concerned about the future. I, I think, Monica, you notably said that it's not just going to be a technical problem. There are always going to be people who are going to be bad actors and take advantage of, of such an important platform like Facebook. So I'm wondering, uh, what, about $12 billion in profits from Facebook? Uh, uh, I was thinking about uh, BMW's uh, driving courses that it offers for uh, people who want to learn how to drive better. I'd love to see Facebook start something where you throw a billion dollars into a fund that helps teach media and uh, social media literacy uh, throughout uh, the K through 12 system with some of that, because that will help mm -hmm. to have your users and future users navigate their way through a landscape that, that's going to be littered with this information no matter what you do. So again, apologies for a comment more than a question, but I'd be interested in your feedback well, if, on that. Well, if I can kind of take it, yeah, I think it's a, a, it's a, a, a good comment and, and sort of a, a question too. Um, there is a lot, I agree we can do more. Um, there is a lot we're doing right now to build uh, digital savvy um, among uh, younger populations and also on specific topic areas to fight hate, to fight um, disinformation to fight violent extremism. Um, some of that is with, with youth and just a few initiatives that come to mind. We've got something where we're working with, um, and this is addition to what we're doing with, with uh, Cronkite School, but um, in the UK we're working, we are in secondary schools working with educators to, um, to, to train students in schools. Uh, we have a university program that we um, fund with Adventure Partners that's around countering hate and extremism where 200 uh, universities field teams from around the world. They compete with one another on creating platforms to fight extremism. And a lot of that is just educating young people about, um, about how they can combat this online. And then we've seen that reach tens of millions of people um, with, the, with uh, these messages about fighting hate and extremism. Um, so there's, there's a lot we're doing. I think um, based on what we see with our relationships and with the research going forward, we'll continue to fund those. One area where we, and this I think is a billion euro or a two billion euro effort, something that we launched in Europe is called our Online Civil Courage Initiative. And the reason I mention this one is there's, there's, there's spending money and there's direct act efforts that Facebook could do, but there's also uh, the importance of finding ways to empower groups who are already working on these sorts of efforts. So Online Civil Courage Initiative brings together civil society groups from around Europe. Um, we do research that we share with them. They're doing their own research, which they can share into the hub. It, uh, Institute for Strategic Dialogue is playing sort of the leadership role here. But the idea is all the different groups learning from one another and learning from the research we're doing into what really works to, to counter the abuses that we see online and to create a more informed uh, digital population. Another question, maybe right here in the blue checker. Hi, uh, Sam Delano with uh, the Osgood Center for International Studies. And I'm just wondering, in regards to Facebook, like private groups, I know there are groups that exist like Ancapistan, which has like 55,000 members. And they may say that they are anarcho-capitalists, but a lot of the content that they post is memes that spread hate speech and virulent racism. and lampooning of child sexual abuse and topics such as that. So is there sort of a, a line that Facebook draws within these groups where you have to uh, join as a member, but is there still a line that Facebook draws that is like, this is hate speech, it yeah. doesn't matter if it's humorous by the poster or by the people within the group, but we still cannot allow this content to be on our site? Yes, um, and I, I should have made this clear earlier. Our, our standards, our community standards, apply across all the content on Facebook. So whether it's a, a 
public post or in a private group or in a private message, the policies still apply. Now, one question is, yeah, but how do you become aware of it? Um, and the answer is, we do actually still get reports. We get reports in pri from private messages. We also get reports from secret groups. Um, but we also recognize that you're not as likely in, in some communities to get these reports, and that's one of the reasons that the, the technical tools are so important to us. So um, we don't have a humor exception for hate speech. And so if there is something that is uh, being shared that is uh, you know, uh, crossing the line and we're becoming aware of it in one of those groups, whether we become aware of it through our technical tools or a user report, we will remove it. There's a threshold for pages and groups. If you've got a page and somebody posts on it something that violates our policies, most likely, I mean, it depends on the exact situation, but most likely that piece of content's gonna be removed and that's it. Even if you're the administrator of the group, we would remove it, we'd give you a warning, and we'd say don't do it again. Um, at a certain point, if you've had multiple violations, your entire page uh, will come down, um, or you'll lose your ability to post. And that's true with groups, too. If we see that the group, like the title of the group or the purpose of the group, violates our policies, like it's for terror propaganda or it's to bully somebody, then the whole group will come down. Um, otherwise, if there are a number of violations within that group, depending on the severity of the violation, the entire group will come down. Maybe right here on the aisle. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, Liza Goitin from the Brennan Center for Justice. How are you? Um, I had a two-part question on how you handle disinformation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Allergies. <clears throat> and first of all, you had said that for the most part, like you would take down actual fake accounts that sort of take you off site to some something that they want you to buy. Um, how do you treat? Do you do takedowns in other circumstances? For example, how would you treat, you know, a, a sort of uh, far right-wing news organization that's posting, uh, that's reporting on, say, the Comet Pizza story as fact, presenting that as fact. Uh, does that stay up, and does that get some, some of those sort of accompanying articles that you were saying that you could send people to see with a little eye about what that organization is? Um, you know, or if you move to a more gray area and you have Fox News reporting on FBI spies being placed within the campaign, within, sorry, within the Trump campaign in 2016, <clears throat> And then my, my sort of second part of that question is um, the links to other context and the, and the eye, is that, does that only apply to uh, news that, that's been flagged or that, that has been deemed to be potentially disinformation or is that going to be across the board uh, in order to kind of cover some of those gray areas where it's not so clear? Great question. So, and, and the short answer is there's a lot we're testing right now and I think, I think these are all going to continue to evolve. Right now, although it, just, it depends on the specific facts involved in the case, but right now generally um, when you mention like somebody sharing information about the uh, common pizza, the general approach would be showing the related articles and, give it, and, and down ranking. And when we down rank, uh, that's about, eight, they'll lose about 80% of their uh, distribution. So down ranking um, and, uh, and giving the additional context behind the source and the related articles is the, is the primary um, tool there. Uh, the, the second part of your question. Your challenge like, with the, with the uh, sending people to other articles for context and the little eye button, is that going to be across the board? Oh. Or is it something that's something we're working, we're working on figuring out the scope of right now. Um, right now, that would be if it is something that is flagged and has been checked by the third party fact checkers. It's, it's an interesting topic to think about because um, you can obviously take this, take it to a really extreme example where, you know, Peter and I are on Facebook talking really just to one another, and I say, uh, you know, the Warriors lost the game last night, and that's not actually true. Should Facebook be putting underneath my post to Peter, um, you know, <laughs> stories about the Warriors winning? Um, so it's, it, it, we, I think we're trying to figure out what, where it does make sense to, to draw those lines. And then also, there, for and all of our policy issues, for yeah, for all of our policy issues, there are also these operational considerations. Can you do this with, with a reasonable degree of accuracy um, at this scale around the globe. Right here in the glasses. Thank you. Um, Sarah Nugent from the Institute of International Education. Um, I had the pleasure for the past three years of actually working on the P2P, the Person to Person Combating Violent Extremism program for the Bay Area. The I love that program. Um, which was wonderful, and I worked on the international side, um, bringing them to the Bay Area, um, and I saw the impact of these counter narratives and empowering them to create these counter narratives. Um, you talked about the number of accounts that were removed for terrorist account 
accounts, et cetera. Um, but how are you measuring the success of these counter narratives and further empowering not just youth against terrorism, but perhaps on a wider scope? Such a great question. So that, that when I mentioned earlier the um, program where we have hundreds of, of uh, universities competing uh, to create these campaigns against hate and extremism, um, how do we measure the success of those campaigns? Right now, the, the most raw measurement is just reach. And that's in terms of um, just how many people are engaging with the content or the ideas or the, the platforms, the tools that these groups are creating. And so there we've seen tens of millions of people reach. I, I'd have to look on our site. We have a, if you go to, I think it's counterspeech.fb.com, you can, you can read about these campaigns. Um, and I want to say, although don't hold me to this, but I want to say it's like more than 60 million people that we know have been um, reached through these campaigns. So it's a big number. Um, but are you reaching the right people? And that's something that we're, uh, we're working to understand more. Um, we've seen some of, these, some of the students actually come up with creative ways of measuring engagement. One team that won, it was an American team, um, and their campaign uh, was they were creating these videos that were combating uh, extremist organizations of all different stripes. And one of the things that they saw was that they were getting attacked by, um, their campaigns were really getting like, techn technical attacks by um, some of these extremist organizations, which they, they measured as, um, as a degree of success. So, so we're seeing different ways of sort of measuring um, success of these campaigns, but I don't think we have a great way right now of really understanding how we're reaching, if we're reaching the right audiences. With any counter speech campaign, you have a, counter, you have a campaign against um, you know, uh, ISIS. Let's just pick a group that's often in the news. Um, you can reach overall society or you can reach people who are the indirect influencers of the at-risk population, or you can reach the at-risk population, or you can reach people who are actually uh, considering radical ideologies. So this funnel gets smaller, and it's obviously it's harder to reach people at the, at the bottom of the funnel, but, um, but arguably you know, it's, it's more important to reach a fewer number of people there, a smaller number of people there, than, than uh, to reach bigger numbers. And people differ on that sometimes. But, um, so that's what we're trying to understand. The patient guy in the front here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alexander Kravitz from Insight. This has been most interesting. I'm having difficulty coming down to just two questions. You know, when one thinks of a policymaker, one thinks of somebody in a big, you know, in a federal position or in federal government or state government, and you actually are, you are a policymaker in the private sector. And, and I was curious, I, I, I picked up on, um, you know, the, the, the Content Standards Forum every yes. other Tuesday. So it seems that every other Tuesday you're making policy, right, mm -hmm. on, a, on a very quick changing environment. And I'm just curious, you know, at the broader level, if you could kind of comment, you, you were in government as well, so how does, in a way, the, the policy makers, call them the, 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 the public sector policy makers, kind of compete, if you will, with you? In other words, how are they, how can they be, how can they be, how, how are they able to make policy that, that, that is, a, let's say, good policy that uh, compared to, you know, do they have the flexibility, do they have the agility? Um, and then just another quick question on, on, fake, on fake accounts. What about the case of an activist in Syria or Iraq, an anti-ISIS uh, activist, who sets up a fake account, you know, to combat ISIS, and he does it for his own security? I mean, how, how do you address that? Yeah, Thank I'll, you. Um, great questions, and I'll take the second one first. So our, we have zero tolerance for fake accounts, and that means we sometimes take down accounts that are fake for good reasons. So uh, if somebody is an activist and they are trying to combat a, um, a group, or sometimes we'll see this with, uh, you know, we talk a lot to terrorism researchers, and I've had terrorism researchers say to me, you've got to let us have some of these fake accounts because this is how we, this is how we understand. Um, how, how people interact with this content. And um, I'm sympathetic as a former prosecutor, but our, our, our overall feeling is we think this content isn't safe for our community, and we think, uh, we think that the, the clearest way for us to do this is to just say we can't ever allow the fake accounts, nor can we allow accounts that have been identified as bad to stay up on the site, which sometimes uh, we're also asked to do. Yes, if it's, if it's a fake account, we will remove it anyway. And I understand there are casualties to that, uh, and that's, often, that's true with a lot of our policies. There's, uh, 
there are some times where, where people will say, um, you know, this is a, a, an example that I've gotten from governments from time to time. They'll say, can't you just leave this person's sharing terror propaganda. Can't you please just leave this account up, even though this person's violated your policies? It's really useful for us. And it, that, is, that is a hard question, but ultimately our, um, our obligation is to keep our community safe by, by removing the bad actors as soon as we find them. Um, and then to your other question about uh, the policymaking process, um, it, it's interesting. I mean, th there, is a certain, there is a certain speed at which we can operate in, in Facebook um, because it's... Um, because it's not the same thing as going that you're right, I was in government, and like there are certain steps you have to go through in government, and, um, and there is a little more flexibility when you're talking about writing content policies within a private company. But I think over the years, we've actually moved more in the direction of putting more of those procedural safeguards in place. Um, we do change policy, we do uh, have policy refinements every two weeks, um, but there's much more it's, it's, it's become much more structured. And part of that is the input from around the company, input from outside the organization. Um, it does reduce our flexibility. I actually think it's better. I think we're making more, um, uh, we think, I think we're making better informed decisions now. Um, and, and one thing I uh, just wanted to point out, uh, because you've raised this question about how frequently we, we refine our policies, about a month ago, we published the internal guidance that we give our reviewers on our policies. So now if you go to our community standards, you can see the high-level policy. We don't allow, you know, hate speech. And then you can click read more, and you can click read more, and you'll see the details that we actually give our reviewers when they're implementing these policies. Um, because we change our policies fairly frequently, that guidance is going gonna, is gonna to also change uh, pretty frequently. That would be much harder to do in a, in a legal or regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. um, all the way on the aisle there. Hi, thank you so much. Tara Maller with the Counter Extremism Project and also a fellow here at New America in the security program. Um, so I appreciate you walking through sort of what you've done on counterterrorism. I just, I've heard you testify at the, before the Commerce Committee and I heard the Zuckerberg testimony and there seems to be somewhat of a tension in describing terrorist content removal versus prevention of upload. And the terms seem to keep being used interchangeably. So the number that Peter pointed out, 1.9 million ISIS al-Qaeda images over the past year, in your own release says were removed or flagged when they were already up. But yet you also said that there's a hashing database which you're using to screen and find. And on child pornography, that's, that's used to prevent upload. So I was just wondering if you could just walk me through the distinction and if these numbers apply to prevention of upload of ISIS and Al-Qaeda content or finding it once it's already up, which would seem to be two very different things. Um, so for example, in child pornography, the database that Nick Mick holds like tens of thousands of images, it prevents mil tens of millions of being from ever reaching the platform. So what's the comparable number for that on terrorism if you're preventing upload? And if you're not preventing upload, could you clarify that a bit? Yes, so those, the, those numbers do include the prevention of upload. One of the distinctions that we've drawn is we've recently, over the course of the past year, developed a tool that allows us to actually go back and find content that had already been uploaded to the site. We didn't have that before. So now the, the distinction is, um, I mentioned earlier, if we know about a beheading video or we know about a child sexual abuse image, we can stop that from hitting the platform. What we could not do until, I don't know, roughly a year ago, what we could not do was um, take that beheading video and see if somebody else had already uploaded it to Facebook. We actually just could not find uh, the link between those two things. We've now developed tools that are allowing us to do that. So in the blog post that we just put out, we, we have a category that we say, this is how much we've uh, removed, and, that, and then we separate out. This is the content that was already on the platform that was old that we went back and found. Um, when we're talking about the overall removals, that is including where people have attempted to upload it and we're stopping at the time of upload. Uh, sure, right there. Hi, uh, Mark Ginsburg, former United States diplomat and worked extensively in the Middle East. I have a question about the how-to videos when it comes to terrorism and the content on Facebook. There are thousands of, how, of uh, content uh, the content that we have seen and I've seen on how to construct bombs on Facebook. Uh, it may not fall within hate speech or terrorism content, but to me it is terrorism content. Uh, it is still up on Facebook. In addition, 
I'm still seeing, and if there is progress being made in the removal of content, there is still a significant amount of radical uh, jihadi content that is not being flagged by your individual flaggers. Uh, there is new technology that is out there, but the companies that I've talked to seem to have been frozen out from being able to participate in your forums, and Facebook has been very selective in deciding who is in and who is out of this process. So, for example, uh, the technology that the counter-extremism project has offered Facebook has not been even used as a, as a potential project to test its capacity. And I'm wondering why that's the case. Sure. Um, so first, it, it's, it's definitely not accurate that we're selective about uh, which companies we allow to uh, be part of this consortium. We've been very public. Um, we, we want all tech companies to, to come and be a part of this. And we've added um, any company that has wanted to be added to the hash sharing consortium, we have added. So that, that process is going well. Um, in terms of technologies, we're, we're very open to technologies that provide something than what we're, other than what we're already doing. Um, and we remain open to conversations with Counter Extremism Project. If there are technologies that you have that uh, you think could be useful to us, that we'd be very happy to entertain those. What about the issue of videos? Yeah, um, great. Those, those do violate our policies. Um, and you're right, there are, and not just with bomb making videos, but with other terrorist content, there are things that we miss, and there are areas where we definitely need to to get better, both in terms of building our technical tools and uh, making it very easy for people to flag this content to us. But uh, they, they do violate our policies and should be removed. Uh, maybe right on the aisle there. Hey, uh, David Ensor of George Washington University. Uh, what, uh, as a former prosecutor, I'd be interested now working at Facebook, what do you think is the appropriate relationship between the United States government and Facebook as a company. Um, are there any sorts of federal regulations that do not now exist, but that you would support being put into place? Uh, wh what's the appropriate relationship between Facebook and government? Uh, in, in what way, do you, do you see Facebook at all as a public utility? I think a lot of people use it that way. They do. I mean, I, I uh, see Facebook as a, as a private service, um, but I do think uh, the relationship, I mean, de government definitely has a, a, a role in, um, in these conversations, and we, we welcome that. And regulation is something that uh, we're certainly not category oppo categorically opposed to, and, and Mark said that in his recent testimony as well. Um, we, part of my job is to regularly engage with government, not just in the US, but around the world. So when I'm here, and I'm here probably, I don't know, maybe once a month, a regular part of my job is sitting down with policymakers or, um, or others in government and explaining what we're doing and making sure that they can reach us. So there's part of the relationship is open lines of communication. And that I, I believe we need to have, not just in the US, but everywhere with different governments. Um, two is, I think, uh, safeguards and transparency. So when we're engaging with governments and they're asking us to remove speech, or they're asking us for user data. We have strict protocols that they have to go through. I explained the content one a little bit. If they want to request user data, user data, they have to go through our, um, our process with our legal team, where they submit the legal process. And if required to by law, we will provide the data. Um, there are also times when we will proactively provide data to law enforcement. And that would be if there is an imminent risk of physical harm like somebody is uh, planning a terror attack or somebody is uploading an image of child sexual exploitation where we would actually, in accordance with our terms of the law, we would actually provide that to law enforcement. So there's all three of those ways that we do interact with um, law enforcement authorities in, in a way that has real impact on, on um, individual users. And what I think we need to do there is make sure our safeguards are in place and then just make sure we're being transparent about it. That's why we publish our government uh, request report. We're, um, you know, around the world, we're, we're very actively engaged in understanding what regulators are wanting to accomplish. Often our incentives are aligned. If they don't want terrorists using Facebook, we don't want them doing that either. Um, and, uh, you know, they want privacy and control for users, we want the same thing. So, uh, yes, I think there are, um, there are uh, 
uh, paths forward where we should be talking to governments and just making sure that we're helping to shape regulations. Um, here in the black. Hi, uh, my name is Nuhbat and I'm from uh, Voice of America. Um, as you uh, mentioned the third party uh, fact checkers, could you please elaborate what exactly, I mean, how do you mean what, what exactly they are? Is this artificial intelligence? How much it is uh, by the human interaction? What exactly, how, how does it work? Yes, um, it works. There are actual organizations that, um, and I'm not, I'm not deeply involved in this process, but we have a team that manages relationships with third-party fact-checking organizations um, where if content has been flagged for us by, as being false, then we send it out to, these, to multiple fact-checking organizations. And then if they debunk it and say that something is false, that's what will trigger the additional context. that We, we don't remove something um, because it's been debunked by these organizations, but we will put that additional context underneath. Here and a suit, you're right there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Berg from the Stimson Center, but let me just ask a simple citizen's question about disinformation. Are you seeing trends uh, uh, leading into the uh, election later this year that we ought to know about in terms of disinformation? And what's your feeling about? Uh, uh, the qualitative differences that we might expect in disinformation towards the 2020? Um, I don't have anything specific to offer. Um, I, I can say that I think uh, an important part of us recognizing those trends is going to be not, is going gonna, is gonna to be, uh, just like we've done with terror propaganda, engaging more with other players, industry, governments, and civil society. And so we're trying to build those relationships now to get earlier signals. I think we'll have some visibility into it, but just like with what uh, Russian IRA did around 2016, we're a piece of it, but I don't think we'll be able to do our best job unless we're talking to others. Uh, Emerson Brooking, writer. Um, I had a question about Facebook's institutional history. Um, I'm sorry, I'm I had a question about Facebook's uh, history as an institution. Um, thinking back, although I know it would have uh, preceded your arrival, um, was there a moment when it became evident that Facebook would be a forum for political violence? And that, Facebook would be what? Uh, be a forum uh, for political violence. And as the uh, a gentleman up there said earlier, that Facebook in time would become uh, essentially a, a private policymaker. Um, well, there's, there's always been, since I've joined the company and before I joined the company, there have always been bad actors trying to use Facebook for whether it's coordinating harm or violence or, um, you know, sharing hate speech um, or other types of abuse. So that's always existed. And when I joined the company, I, I certainly knew that I would be working on that. Um, in terms of the process, the, the question about, uh, are we moving more towards um, uh, government structures? Um, I, think there ha I think as companies grow, it's probably a pretty natural part of the process that the, you start to have more, st more structure and um, a feeling of more need for accountability and, no and openness. And I think that we have seen that and very steadily over the course of my time at Facebook. The, even just the transparency around what we do with content enforcement. Five years ago, we really didn't talk about it. In May of 2015, we launched our first uh, detailed version of our community standards, and, and we said that we had, um, I don't know, we, I think we said we had like hundreds of reviewers or some, whatever we had at the time. So we started giving a little bit more information, and now I think we're at the level where we're being a lot more, a lot more open and putting a lot more procedural safeguards in place, and I think that's, um, that's a natural part of a company that has grown bigger and is recognizing that people want to know what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, we've got one in the back there. There you go. Hi, Alan Rosenblatt with uh, Lake Research Partners and Turner 4D. Uh, it's been a long standing sort of three pronged strategy for hate groups and terrorist groups to get their information out, refute. Uh, contrary messages and then recruit people off thread that are potential supporters. That gives rise to concerns about private messaging 
Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, uh, private messages on Instagram. Uh, I've noticed recently on the Facebook Messenger, for example, there's no way to flag a, a message. You can only click to go to the profile of the person and flag the profile. And if they're sending a secret message using your new encrypted op option, the profile, the op option to view the profile has been removed. So there's absolutely no way to report that particular message coming to you if you wanted to. So could you speak to what mm -hmm. you're planning to do to deal with um, giving people the opportunity to flag messages and what you might, other things you might be doing in that space? Yes, and maybe we can follow up with you afterwards and say maybe we can uh, follow, follow up with you and see what you're seeing. We do test, just so everybody knows, we do test different reporting flows in, with uh, different, uh, you know, in different parts of the world and different populations to see what tends to bring in the most reports. Um, but you should be able to, you should always be able to flag a message thread for us. Um, so I want to understand what's happening there. Now, we, you're right, with encrypted messaging services, it works very differently. If there's, there, uh, on WhatsApp, for instance, WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. We use encryption on Facebook, of course, it's part of running a secure service, but but end-to-end -end encryption is where it's actually encrypted um, at, at one user's device and then it is, is unencrypted at the other user's device and we actually don't see the content. So if there's an encrypted WhatsApp message or somebody has opted in to send an encrypted message on fa through Facebook Messenger, we actually never see that content um, and, and couldn't if, even if the person wanted to report it to us. So that does present uh, unique challenges for us. As far as what we're doing going forward, um, we're looking at ways that we can, if having WhatsApp, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging service as part of our family of apps means that we may have the opportunity to use some of the learnings from Facebook if we've identified a bad actor on Facebook to actually take action against uh, people on WhatsApp. We have to make sure we're doing that consistent with uh, privacy and terms, but that's one way that, that we think we can help uh, create a safer environment there as well. And down here in the front on the base. Hi, my name is Rebecca McCord. I'm an intern uh, doing foreign policy and defense for American Enterprise Institute. My question is, youth are particularly vulnerable to uh, violent extremist organization recruitment. My question is, what exactly are you doing to counter this, and how exactly are these organizations targeting youth on your platform? I understand this makes up probably a large base of your users. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say that terrorist recruitment makes up a, a, a large uh, percentage of, of content on Facebook. Um, uh, no, sorry, youth make up. Oh, youth, okay, sorry, sorry, youth, <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, countering the recruitment, part of it is removing the propaganda, but that's not where it ends. Finding the propaganda is actually the, easier, the, the, the easiest part of this because we can use the technical tools to find things like the video. But um, as the gentleman in the back pointed out, the recruitment of, often takes a, a different shape um, it might start with somebody seeing a video, but then there might be uh, messages or other reach outs. And also what's hard is that this isn't, this isn't confined to one platform. Um, we've seen and researchers have pointed out to us as well that sometimes what it is is you see a link on one side and then it says, come join this thread on this other s social media service and, and there's a lot of sort of cross-platform work. Um, so what, what we can do is use whatever starting point we have, and often that is going to be the removal of a terror propaganda image, and then use other tools to go from there. Um, terror academics tell us that uh, the best way to find uh, a terrorist is to find his or her friends, um, find that, that network, and so that's something that we do try to leverage. So if we find an entry point, and we've found a group, or we have found even just a single video, one thing that we do is fan out from that. Um, and uh, as we build our relationships with other companies, where uh, we're trying to share, for instance, the content that we do, that we do find that we can hash and, and put in this database that we can help stop the cross-platform cross movement as well. I don't think we're done figuring out the ways that we can um, collaborate cross-platform, but uh, it's definitely something that we understand as an issue. And we have time for one more question. So who, okay, in the, did you already ask a question? Here. Oh, okay. Uh, during your app review, have you found... If, if you could tell us who you are. Too. Oh, sorry. Oh, Max Marshall, I do information defense. Um, 
Throughout your app debut, have you found any state actors using apps to collect data? And more broadly, what other information operations, influence operations, have you identified being leveraged by state actors on the platform? Um, I uh, with, with the app review, you mean in the, the app review I talked about with 2013, going back and looking at? Um, that's not something that I know the latest details of, so I'd have to look back at what we've released publicly, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think there's been anything on that. That's also another area where I'd probably have to refer you to our posts. I know we put something out, we put out a post maybe two months ago on Internet Research Agency and what we'd done there. And I'm, I don't know if we reference any other investigations there, but I will say that this is not something where, when we look for these investigations, we're not, we're not focused on one particular country. Um, we're definitely looking for influence operations across the board. Great. Um, is there anything you, we haven't covered, it's been covered, for, um, that you'd like to make sure, or, or get us up to speed on things that are going on around your policies and what you have coming up? Uh, no, I guess I would say, um, I'll just come back to again the, the, a, plug, a shameless plug for our community standards, the new version that we just put out. This was not an easy uh, decision or an easy thing to actually affect. The guidance that we give the reviewers is, it, it changes frequently and it's also, um, when you look through it, if, if you haven't done so, I would actually encourage, encourage you to do it because you'll find some things in there that, will, that may actually strike you as um, as unusual or surprising. And um, I think the thing to, and, and we're very interested in feedback on that, so that's why I would encourage you to do it. Um, one of the reasons that you might find things interesting or surprising mm -hmm. is because when you think about writing a policy that maybe all of us in this room could sit and apply to 10 pieces of content per day, that's very different than writing a policy that's gonna cover the evaluation of um, you know, millions of pieces of content every week in dozens of languages around the world. And so we have to try to write this very objective guidance for these issues that are actually very contextual, where uh, sometimes objective guidance isn't sort of the natural um, way that you would want to try to, to uh, write rules around these things. Um, so for instance, around uh, credible violence. We want to remove credible threats, but we don't want to remove you know, one of my daughters saying to the other one, like, I'm gonna kill you if you come home late today. Um, so how do, you, how do you distinguish between those two things? And when you, when you look at the rules we're writing, that's what we're, we're often, there's a principle, and we state that principle at the top of the rule, and then we're often trying to think, how do you write objective guidance for thousands of reviewers around the world to, uh, to actually apply this principle? That's the challenge that we are most often grappling with, and. Um, I don't think we always get it right. We're, we're learning all the time, but I'm, I would welcome you to, to see what that looks like and would love to hear your feedback. What's your favorite weird thing in there? Um, well, like, I can't this believe might my career led to actually, this if you weirdest look thing at, that I ever thought I'd write. Well, I think the, the nudity policies are actually really interesting. One of the things with the nudity policies is uh, we want to make sure that we are not allowing the sharing of um, non-consensual nude imagery. And even if somebody consents to a nude image being taken, it doesn't mean that person's consenting to that image being shared. We also want to make sure we're not allowing the sharing of uh, images of underage people, uh, nude images of underage people. And then uh, we also don't want this to become just a pornography site where people are, are sharing pornography. So you take those three interests and then you try to craft rules that objectively distinguish and it becomes really, really difficult. That was one area where when I joined the team, I looked at some of the rules we had and said, this doesn't make any sense to me. And then when, I, then when they showed me a bunch of images and had me try to write a better rule, I thought, okay, now I get it. And, um, <laughs> and we, re we refined the rules over time. So uh, the general rule is if it's a drawing or a painting or something of nudity, it's allowed. Uh, if it is an image of a nude person, like a, a real photograph, it's not allowed unless, and then we've tried to carve out these exceptions, like where we know that generally we're not gonna have to worry about those three interests that I mentioned. So it's a breastfeeding photo, okay. 
uh, breastfeeding. This is going to be an adult. There's probably consent. Um, we're not as worried about it being pornography, although I'm sure there's breastfeeding pornography. Um, you know, there's, uh, so that we've carved that out. And then uh, also if there's nudity and it's in the context of cancer awareness or post-surgery photos, there are some carve-outs we can make. Something's in the context of a political protest, and we have the context around that political protest. But it's, it actually gets really hard when you say, well, this in this country is considered non-sexual art, and you look at that photo, and then you look at another photo, and it's like, you know, this in this other country would be considered sexual exploitation of this person, and you're trying to write a rule that distinguishes between the two. That's very hard. Um, we do have a newsworthy policy that you'll mm -hmm. see in our standards. Like the Nippon um, Girl. Exactly. So that's yeah, when that we launched that policy. Um, I don't know, this is a few years ago now, but many of you probably remember there was this image of uh, the girl in Vietnam running away from the napalm attack and a lot of news coverage of the fact that Facebook removed this photo, at least initially. We, we ended up putting it back up. But um, the reason was because we have a policy that says if you have a prepubescent minor with genitals showing, take the image down, which we would all probably agree is, is the right place to have the general policy. But then what we want to do is make these exceptions or these carve-outs for situations where um, we, we don't have to worry about these safety concerns. With the napalm girl image, that woman is an adult. She is okay with that image being shared. By the way, interestingly, from what I've read, at one point she was not okay with that image right, being shared right. when she was younger. So um, that maybe underscores some of the difficulties here. But uh, anyway, thanks for coming. I hope you'll take a look at the policies. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. And I'll be around a little bit after. And join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Kalia.